Hello everyone and welcome to my talk on intro to IVN and free Canvas tools uh, for SynCon 2021. My name is Kamal Ghali. I'm going to be your host for today's uh, car hacking workshop. And yeah, let's, uh, let's just go ahead and get started with the talk. Try not to waste too much time. We have a lot of fun stuff to get into uh, going forward. So what have we got? We've got a speaker introduction, first of all. So my name is Kamal Ghali. I am an automotive cybersecurity technology architect at a company called White Motion. Uh, White Motion is a, it's not a very, you know, super well-known company, but it's a subsidiary of the larger automotive supplier Morelli. Uh, that's originally based out of Italy, but I personally am based out of Tokyo. Uh, White Motion is mostly focused on cybersecurity, both automotive, IoT, traditional cybersecurity services, consulting, etc., so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so I, I work for this company. We do internal penetration tests, external penetration tests, training for customers. So if that's something you're interested in at all, either for yourself or for your employer, then by all means, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch. I'm a trilingual car hacking enthusiast. Uh, I, I'm originally from the United States, but as mentioned before, I do now live in Japan, uh, but I also do speak Arabic. So um, that is kind of the third language I, I speak, you know, English, Japanese, and Arabic, right? That's kind of my, my trifecta. Sorry, my hair is kind of kind of kind of kind of messy today. I'm ha having a busy day, so unfortunately, uh, I haven't really had time to 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 take care of my appearance. Um, but uh, I'm heavily active in the ASRG. ASRG is the Automotive Security Research Group. It's a group dedicated to spreading awareness for automotive cybersecurity and enabling people to get involved in the uh, in the community. It's a it's a free to participate community, of course. So if you if you ever want to learn any more, just please. Feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to put you in touch with someone, uh, maybe heading a local branch in your area. If you're interested in starting a branch in your area, you're welcome to do so. It's more or less a locally run international organization, right? It's We've got members in all parts of the world, but each small branch is managed by the local members where we have uh, talks, etc. every month and just share information with one another. So uh, within automotive security, I have a couple of areas of interest as of recent. So Bluetooth is one, USB, radio frequency. These are all things that I enjoy. And of course, a little bit of digital forensics. And when I'm not in the garage, uh, I enjoy cooking, fighting games. Uh, I, I have a ukulele that I don't play often enough. and uh, But I do also enjoy going for long walks and getting lost in new places. So let's talk about today's talk. So today's talk is going to be a very quick introduction to an in-vehicle network. We're not going to cover a lot of background information regarding automotive cybersecurity as a, as a field, as an industry, we're gonna kind of jump straight into the in-vehicle network side of things. Uh, in-vehicle networks being uh, one of the key aspects of automotive cybersecurity and one of the key aspects of security in automotive that makes it different from traditional IT or IoT security. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very important, I guess, fundamental block of the automotive cybersecurity industry. And knowing your way around the IVN situation is kind of the difference between a traditional security practitioner and someone who's actually involved in automotive security. So we're gonna be uh, focusing a little bit on that today. We're gonna go over CAN bus. So CAN bus is the, the main character for today's talk. Uh, it's the most popular in-vehicle network in use today, of course. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what it is, where it's used, why it's used so often, and you know, why it's still being used today. Uh, and then we're gonna introduce some CAN tools that anyone uh, can use, right? These are going to be freely available open source software tools that anyone can download from the internet. And if you have a CAN bus device, you'll be able to hook it up to your computer and start actually reading some CAN data. And even if you don't have a CAN bus device, I'll show ways for actually creating a virtual CAN bus, uh, a CAN bus that exists entirely in software in your own computer that you can use. It's very good for like a learning platform or if you need to simulate or test something, a uh, virtual CAN bus does the trick just fine. It behaves more or less exactly the same as a regular CAN bus, uh, as far as the, you know, minus the physical aspects, of course. But it, it, it does the trick, especially if you're just, you know, getting started in CAN, if you're new to the industry. Uh, it's, it's very good to be able to know how to set one of those up. So let's go ahead and get started. What is an in-vehicle network? So an in-vehicle network is, well, obviously enough, it's a network designed for vehicles. But what kind of network is it? Where is it used? An in-vehicle network refers specifically to the networks that different components inside a vehicle use to communicate with one another. Right. The components side of vehicle we're going to be referencing in today's talk, we, we call them ECUs, right? Electronic control units. This could be, um, as, as you can see in the, in the graphic over there, 
uh, like a like 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 a board with a couple of chips on it, maybe a couple of different interfaces. This is a general like a like a logical object we would call an ECU inside a car. It has its own job. It has its own, you know, place or part to play in the vehicle ecosystem. It helps make sure that the car is is running and doing all of its car things, right? Changing the air conditioner, etc., so on and so forth. Braking. Each ECU is going to be a little bit different, but the networks that we're talking about today. Are the networks that these components use to share information among one another right you have a lot of different ecus in your vehicle each one of them is taking care of a different task but they need to share information with one another sometimes sometimes you may need to report to your stereo how fast you're going because a lot of cars these days will have a mechanism where if you're going faster the music will automatically turn up the volume to compensate for the the louder sounds outside uh, so, so it, this is one example of course there's a million examples also you can think of your your instrument cluster uh, accurately reflecting the speed of your vehicle in a manner that the human being can understand. So that's another use in vehicle networks is sharing information from the control parts of the vehicle to the display parts, uh, like an instrument cluster. So what makes them a little bit different in their actual design relative to standard, you know, IT networks? I'm talking things like, you know, your standard internet or, you know, IP network kind of traditional networking, as, as, as we'll put it, right, your, your usual you know, home internet. What's what, what what's different about the network and use in these vehicles, right? So they're designed with very specific purposes in mind. Off, off, you know, first of all, uh, they're designed to have reliability, right? Because these are devices that are going to be communicating inside a vehicle. A vehicle is a very heavy object that has people inside it, and these people are very frail. If the vehicle crashes or malfunctions, and God forbid, you may have a situation where bodily harm is the result. Someone may get injured even worse, you know, death in, in, in the worst scenario. So these networks are designed so that they can be used in a very, they're very robust. They're very unlikely to fail and they have a lot of measures included in them to kind of support that, right? Backups, fail safes, so on and so forth. Uh, again, in the same vein of reliability, timing requirements are very important for in-vehicle networks, right? These in-vehicle networks will usually be communicating several times a second, several hundred times a second, depending on the actual network and how much data they're sending, of course, is going to be depend on dependent on the network technology in discussion. But they are often designed with a strict, you know, minimum time guarantee uh, on the transmission of any message across a network bus uh, to ensure that, you know, decisions that require data from different components can be made as fast as possible and accurately without missing their deadlines, as it were. You don't want your airbags going off a little bit late because your accelerometer didn't send the data fast enough. That would be uh, probably a worst case scenario, of course. But uh, And then simplicity. So another thing that differs from traditional uh, general purpose networks is that automotive and vehicle networks are generally designed to have uh, very limited functionality because... You know, you want to maximize your speed and efficiency while also minimizing costs. You don't need a bunch of complicated, you know, overhead in there you don't need a bunch of complex so it does get complicated sometimes i won't i won't lie uh but in general they're a little bit less complex than traditional networking technologies uh and that makes them easier to keep fail safe and and, and, and robust right because there isn't so much you have to account for uh but and you know they're they're a ubiquitous part of the modern vehicle the modern vehicle of course being filled with electronics you know not like the model t from back in whenever uh, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, automobiles have become more or less full, full, full of electronics, right? Your windows are electronic, your, your transmission is automatic, you know, even your steering wheel might have powered steering built into it. So the electronics are slowly starting to overtake the physical mechanical mechanisms of a vehicle, uh, and, you know, especially with electric vehicles moving into 2022, uh, this is going to be a huge part of it, right? So these in-vehicle networks are used for not only sharing information, like we mentioned earlier, but also things like the actual operation of the vehicle. This is uh, what you would call an X by wire system in which a given vehicle network is directly responsible of you know, controlling a phenomenon the vehicle performs, like speed or speeding, excuse me, steering by wire, braking by wire, driving by wire, you know, the actual throttle itself. All these can be linked to an in-vehicle network. And the diagnostics is another really important part of a IVN technology's implementation in a vehicle, right? When someone needs to request information from a component in a vehicle, they'll usually connect to it and request information uh, over an in-vehicle network using diagnostic protocols, right? The diagnostic protocols are often built on top of a given in-vehicle network technology. And I don't think we'll get too deep into diagnostics today just because it is kind of a, a second level 
uh, in vehicle network topic, but for, for the time being, just remember that diagnostics are very closely linked to in vehicle networks in today's vehicles. So, but why is it important to study these, right? We, we mentioned that they're pretty simple, but that doesn't mean that they're child's play. It doesn't mean that they're not worth investing time into understanding. They are more or less unique to automotive. This isn't true because uh, CAN, for example, is very popular for things like robotics. Uh, if, if you're, um, you know, if you ever did first robotics in high school, you may actually have some experience with CAN because CAN actually stands for the controller area network. And we'll talk more about CAN later, of course, but controller could be any controller. It doesn't have to be inside a car. It could be inside a washing machine or it can be inside a train. It could be anywhere really, but it was originally developed for the automotive environment. But in vehicle networks are really the most automotive part of automotive security because the rest of automotive security is more or less, you know, the same as traditional security. We're talking about things like, okay, port scanning your head unit, making sure that, you know, there are no vulnerable services running on it. Okay, well, that much is not exactly, you know, automotive specific, maybe just the component itself is only automotive, but it's running a, a regular operating system, just like any other device, right? Uh, whereas in vehicle networks are more or less unique to automotive, almost like I said, uh, and, they, and they make really the difference between someone who's versed in security versus someone who's versed in automotive cybersecurity. And as, as we mentioned before, they're very crucial to the operation of the vehicle. So knowing how an in vehicle network works is the kind of the alpha and the omega of being able to hack a car because once you compromise your you know your device, you've gotten root access. If you don't know how the actual uh, networks work to communicate throughout the vehicle, you know, you can only go so far. And that's what makes them the most, I guess, fundamental vehicle part of vehicle cybersecurity. So let's go over some of the different in-vehicle network technologies that are in use today. So uh, there are different networks for different tasks. Each of these networks that I have listed here, they have, you know, their own special use cases that they're designed for, right? Automotive Ethernet is a very new example of an in-vehicle network, right? It's very similar to classic Ethernet, but the physical interface is usually a little bit different, but it's, you know, designed to be very, very high bandwidth. We're talking several gigabits per second. This is for devices that need to send a lot of data, maybe visual data, for example, a camera sending a lot of, you know, high quality image data to a different ECU to have processed for self-driving, you know, ADAS systems, collision detection, etc. All of these very computationally intensive processes need a lot of visual data, for example. So coming from a LiDAR sensor or a camera, you'll usually use something with a very high bandwidth like automotive ethernet to carry all that data, right? So automotive ethernet is kind of the expensive, cool, new, you know, top of the line state of the art network that's in use today in automotives. Uh, but of course, there are some things that are not quite as complicated and don't need to have such a complicated um, network technology in place. Uh, one of these network technologies that loves to pick up the slack there is the local interconnect network. Uh, it's, it's usually weird to introduce this one before CAN because LIN was actually created uh, as kind of CAN's little brother, but basically all you need to know is the L in LIN stands for low bandwidth. It's a very, very slow uh, network. I won't go too much into the details for LIN itself, just because this is a, a CAN bus course, of course. Um, but LIN is used for things that are very, you know, very basic, very small amount of information needs to be transmitted. Uh, maybe some diagnostics done over LIN, but it's very rare. It's not very common. Uh, but then there's also things like, you know, non-safety critical systems are usually delegated to LAN because it's very, very cheap, right? It's usually a single wire and it doesn't operate very, very quickly. You know, I think about 250 kilobits per second is the fastest you can go, or maybe even less, actually. I'm, I'm not remembering the exact number off the top of my head right now. Uh, but you could see LIN in stuff like your seat reclining system, right? If you have a seat in your vehicle with an automatic recliner, you can kind of adjust the height, adjust the, uh, the position, the angle. That's usually dedicated to something like LIN because it's not safety critical, as it were, right? You don't have to worry about your car not working in the event something goes wrong in the LIN bus and you can't change the position of your seat, right? It's just not that important. So that's where things like LIN are actually used to save costs while also ensuring that, you know, you haven't uh, sacrificed any real robustness for something that actually needs it. And then finally, you know, the, the main character, of course, is CAN, Controller Area Network. It's probably the most common in vehicle network all over the world. It is actually mandated in the United States and Europe for emissions diagnostics uh, in, in vehicles, um, interestingly enough. 
I'm not going to talk too much about that today. But it's good to know that CAN bus is almost is going to be present in almost every vehicle in the world today. And, you know, I would be very surprised to find a modern vehicle, you know, made in the 2000s and later that doesn't have CAN bus of some sort in it. And what's great about CAN bus is that because of its popularity and ubiquity throughout the industry, there are a lot of free tools available for us that will allow us to actually learn how to use a CAN bus, even if we don't have access to a card of ha hack, which can be expensive, of course, uh, or any hardware, which could also be expensive if you want to buy expensive hardware. There, there's cheap hardware too, but we're going to be focusing on free software only tools in today's lecture, just so that everyone in the world has the opportunity to, to follow along. So the CAN bus crash course, this is not going to be a full in-depth uh, discussion on CAN bus that would take uh, quite a long time. And I, I do want to keep you guys entertained and, and, and hopefully engaged for, for the entire hour I'm here. But the basics of CAN, right? It operates on a bus topology that is multi-master, right? So it is a generally considered a, a two wire network. You can have a third for the ground if you want, but the main ones are the two wires in CAN, CAN high, CAN low. And every node connected to this CAN network is a master on this network. They can transmit at will. They don't need anyone's permission. They have complete autonomy on what they can transmit onto this network. And when you transmit a message onto a CAN bus, all of the nodes on this CAN bus receive the message at the same time, right? And just, oh, I should clarify this. Uh, there are a lot of different CAN standards, but when we talk about CAN today, we're talking about classic CAN 2.0B. There's CAN FD for flexible data rate. There's there's a lot of different types of can there's like the special can for for boats or special can for for trucks j1939 we're not talking about that today we're talking mostly about the classic can 2.0b uh, this is generally you know the most common form of can also known as high speed can just assume that's what we're talking about sorry if that's confusing but there are a lot of different types of can that you might want to learn about more if you get into this field but for now I'm going to stop talking about this and just go on with the uh, with with my talk. So, regular classic CAN supports data frame payloads of up to 8 bytes per payload, right? So you can fit up to 8 bytes of information in one CAN frame. Uh, of course, multiple CAN frames can be linked into one larger CAN message if you use certain higher layer protocols such as uh, ISOTP. Um, but that's a little a little bit uh, more more complicated and and not really appropriate for an introductory course. But CAN is very robust. It has a very good automated error management system that allows it to keep itself from crashing and burning and just bringing down the whole vehicle on accident. Uh, Arbitration-based priority system helps with this as well. Uh, in the arbitration-based priority system, each CAN frame has an arbitration field. We will look at a CAN frame in just a second, of course, so you can see what I'm talking about. But this arbitration field uh, assigns a priority to each message so that you can be sure that the more important messages on your bus are not getting crowded out by less important diagnostic messages or maybe information that isn't quite as relevant to the safety or operation of the vehicle. And that's done through arbitration. Now in arbitration in CAN, you know, zero value is a dominant value and a one value is a recessive value. I'll explain a little bit more about what this means in the next slide when we actually look at what's inside a CAN frame. But know for now that zero is dominant, one is recessive. Uh, it's it's decently fast as far as in-vehicle networks go. It's a good bit faster than LIN that we mentioned earlier, but it's also a good bit slower than um, automotive Ethernet. The cool thing about CAN is that it's just fast enough to do most of the things a vehicle needs to have done, right? As of now, you know, as of today, most vehicles in the world still use CAN, and that's because having more speed isn't necessarily necessary. Isn't necessarily necessary. Isn't strictly necessary in a lot of vehicle subsystems, right? One meg megabit per second is just good enough. And so if it's not broke, don't fix it is kind of the motto uh, the industry has been using and why they still use CAN today. It uses dual wire differential signaling. This makes it very resilient to um, electromagnetic interference, uh, which is very good. Uh, the, the physics behind it is very cool, but essentially because the wires are very closely intertwined and because it's using differential signaling, any noise that applies to both wires will actually get canceled out because the differential will remain the same uh, all the time. So. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting, of course. Uh, I recommend anyone interested in that physical aspect of CAN to look more into it. So let's talk about the actual CAN frame. So there are a couple different types of CAN frames. The most common ones by far are data frames. These are going to take up about 99.5% of every CAN frame you ever see in the world. 
But just for consistency sake, we're going to mention the other ones. Remote frames are often used to request data from a node instead of actually sending data itself. Overload frames are used when a node needs to communicate to other nodes on the bus and kind of ask them to slow down. Maybe its processor isn't fast enough to handle all the data being sent and you can actually use these to slow down a CAN bus. And then error frames, which are very important in, in ensuring that CAN bus operates smoothly. Error frames are used to allow nodes to talk to one another and kind of, if there are any issues with one particular node's transmission, it's able to kind of communicate to the rest of the bus saying like, hey, I'm having a problem. I might need to turn myself off. But the, the error state of CAN bus is very cool, uh, but we're not gonna talk about the error state management and how that works today. It's a little bit more in depth. Um, but the different frames we have, sorry, the different fields we have in a CAN frame are as follows. We have the start of frame field, which is actually just one bit and it's always zero uh, because the CAN bus idle state is usually set at the voltage for one. So when you see a zero appear, that's when a node has indicated, hey, I would like to send a message on the CAN bus. That zero is the sign like, hey, I would like to send some data. So guys, please listen. Uh, following the start of frame bit, we have the arbitration field. Uh, for some reason, I switched the positions of the arbitration and control field in the actual list here, but the arbitration field definitely comes next and it is 12 bits wide. The first 11 bits are used for the actual arbitration ID. Uh, and the last bit is the RTR field. This means, you know, if the RTR field is checked, it essentially means that you're sending a remote frame, but if it's not, it means you're sending a data frame. Now in CAN bus, uh, it's worth mentioning that there are two different types of uh, IDs, right? 11 frame IDs and extended IDs. So 11 frame is the standard and extended IDs are 29 bits. But, for the, you know, for, for today, we're going to be mostly talking about 11 bit identifiers uh, when we were talking about CAN bus, but 29 bit ones work almost exactly the same. They just have a special uh, bit set in the control field that allows them to have 29 bits of arbitration. If you have a lot of nodes on your CAN bus and you need more, um, how should I say, arbitration IDs for your messages, that is definitely uh, an option. Um, and, and by the way, when I say arbitration ID, this doesn't mean that every node, every physical node on the CAN bus is only sending one message. This arbitration ID is not a source address. It is a identifier for the data inside that CAN frame. And any node technically can send data with any arbitration ID, right? So if I have one node that's sending arbitration ID 111 and another node that's sending arbitration 222, nothing is stopping any of these nodes from sending uh, the other nodes message, right? It's not a source address. Uh, this is technically a, 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 you can call it a weakness of CAN is that there's no source addressing. So it's very hard to authenticate where a given CAN message comes from, but uh, it's, it is a feature of arbitration and how arbitration works in CAN. Uh, so the way the arbitration actually works is when two messages collide, right? Whoever has the more dominant arbitration ID will generally be ranked higher. They will have a higher priority and be able to transmit their message without any issues. Whereas any colliding messages with lower priority will actually be forced into ceasing transmission and they will have to reschedule their transmission for some other time, right? They, they'll have an automatic timer according to their, to their programming and it will end up getting scheduled for a later transmission. Um, the control field is for things like metadata for the message, things like the data length code that tell the receiving nodes how much data is being transmitted. So you can send zero bit bytes of data, one byte of data, two byte of data, up to eight, right? Is, is the limit for standard CAN in you know, the context of today's conversation. And then you have the actual payload. So the payload is gonna be up to eight bytes of data. Of course, uh, it's, not, it's not a lot, but it's, it's a lot for, eh, it's good enough for a lot of different, very simple tasks, at least for a single frame. Uh, and then you have a CRC, a cyclic redundancy, code to ensure that no errors occur during transmission. This isn't what you would call a uh, an authentication feature. It's more like a, just an error checking feature for accidental errors. I wouldn't call this a security feature, of course, but it's good for the robustness of the network and, and allows it to operate properly. And then finally, you have the end of frame field, which is seven recessive one bits that allow the bus to kind of realize that, okay, transmission is over. Everyone just kind of chill out for a second and let the end of frame field go out. And then from there, someone who wants to transmit again, will send their zero for the start of frame. And we begin the process all over again. So this is the end of the crash course, right? So the crash course, of course, it's a crash course. It's not going to be 
uh, super in-depth. There's a lot more to be talked about when it comes to CAN bus, and um, I would love to share that with you, but unfortunately, I only have about an hour or so today for today's workshop. And there's a mosquito flying in front of my computer. I hope he's not being picked up on the camera. Um, but we're going to start diving into the actual hands-on usage of some of the tools I want to show you today. So the main package we're going to be using is called CAN Utils. It's a very easy to use, very easy to install, free open source package of CAN bus tools for Linux. It runs on the socket CAN daemon that is, you know, part of most Linux distributions, especially if you're running a modern day uh, Debian distribution, Debian distribution Linux, uh, either, you know, Ubuntu or Kali Linux. I'll be using Kali Linux uh, in the hands-on portion for today. Um, but it's very, very easy to install. One simple command and you'll have access to all these tools. The tools allow you to read data from a CAN bus, uh, send data onto a CAN bus. You can create logs of CAN data using some of the tools here. Uh, and they also have some other ways to view CAN bus that make it a bit easier for reverse engineering data, right? Sometimes it's not easy to know what the data means. And so that's why there are some tools in here to help you figure that out. Uh, there are tools to help you replay a logged CAN bus log file onto a bus with the exact same order of transmission of each of the messages. If you want to try and recreate some kind of phenomenon that occurred on the CAN bus, you can record a CAN log and then play it back. These are all options available to you with the tools found in CAN Utils. And remember, they're all free and they all work without any hardware needed. They work with hardware. If you have some hardware, you can, of course, use these same tools and software to interact with your hardware, but it's not necessary and we won't be assuming you have any hardware today. So never fear, just follow along and, and you'll be able to play along with us. You also have options to generate large volumes of CAN data, virtual CAN bus support, as I mentioned, and of course, most of all, easy to use and free to install. So let's go ahead and dive into the virtual machine very quickly. We will begin with installing the tools and then I will walk you through each of the tools one by one, giving a short explanation of how they work. And if you don't feel like trying to keep up you know, on your own, uh, feel free to just come back and look at this again uh, when you try and implement it yourself. And I think you'll have a great time. So let's go ahead and switch context to the virtual machine. Okay, so here we are safely in our virtual machine. So I am inside a uh, Kali Linux virtual machine, of course. You don't have to use Kali Linux. Um, any Debian distribution should have the ability to install the tools very easily, but I'm using Kali today, so if you are too, awesome. If not, nothing personal, right? So the first thing you wanna do is just go ahead and install the, um, excuse me, the package, right? So sudo apt install can dash utils. This is the command. This is the only command you need to install this. Let me just zoom this in a bit so it's a little bit easier to see on the screen. This is it. It's a one button install, right? I'm gonna put in my password here so that I can actually install this. But I already have the newest version, of course, so it's not gonna be upgraded, but this command is literally the only thing you need to install and everything will just kind of fall into place immediately and you'll be able to start working on a CAN bus all by yourself without needing anything else. It's super painless, super easy to get started. So the first thing I like to do to test if my installation worked correctly is to actually make a CAN bus and then just view some data on it. So let's go ahead and see if I already have one made, sudo ip link. This is a good command to test if you have a CAN bus uh, active already or not. If you guys take a look over here, I already have a CAN bus created vcan0. This is a virtual CAN bus as it were. Right. How did I create this virtual CAN bus, you may ask? That's a great question. So let me show you how. So the easiest way to do this uh, is to set it up with mod probe. So let me go ahead and clear this here. Pseudo mod probe, right? VCAN. This will add the module for VCAN to your system right now. Right? It'll turn it on. Now you want to go and use the pseudo IP link command again to actually create a CAN bus uh, of the type VCAN. So sudo ip link add device right we're going to name our device here i'm going to call it vcan1 because i already have vcan0 enabled as you saw before and i want to say type vcan right, i'm going to hit enter here and then to check that it got up uh, we're going to go ahead and enter sudo sorry ip link and as you can see now we have the vcan0 from before that i had it's still on it it's you know it's doing its thing right but the newly created vcan1 that i just made with this command here is also there waiting uh, currently it's down it's not ready to be used so i can't actually use it if i say can dump vcan1 nothing's going to happen the network is down but we can set it up very easily with ip link so sudo ip link set v up vcan1 
And if I try pin of VKN1 now, it works. There's no data there yet for good reason, but don't worry about it. So if we go back and check this one more time, right? Just drop your link. Oh, I don't know what that pin one at the end was, but it's fine. Uh, we can now see that it is, well, it's not down anymore, right? You see here it said down before, and now it says state unknown. That's fine. It's working. Don't worry about it, right? Now, this same process can be used if you actually have physical CAN hardware. If you have some actual hardware that you want to use with a CAN bus, you can use this same technique to actually bring up your CAN interface. You need to do this before you can receive or send any messages, um, not only for virtual CAN buses, but also for real CAN buses. Right. So you, excuse me, you may want to remember this command in the event you have a, uh, an actual CAN bus device you want to use. But when you're using a real physical CAN bus device, there are a couple things you have to remember. You have to also enable the bit rate or the baud rate for that device right here in the virtual world. It doesn't really matter that much because it's all simulated in software, but in real life, when you set up a CAN interface, you have to specify the baud rate. And the baud rate is, for those of you who might not understand what that is, it's the rate at which this device is reading bits from the wires, right? Because the wires are going to have changing voltages and according to the messages being sent. And this baud rate allows your device to extract information from this changing voltage, right? You did that with the IP link uh, command as well, but just keep in mind you have to do that um, only for physical devices and not for virtual devices. So now I'm gonna go ahead and just clear all this off and let's go back and actually uh, see some real CAN bus data. So how are we going to do that, right? As you may have seen before, I can view data using the CAN dump command, right? So CAN dump, VCAN1, but there's nothing there. And that's because there's no one sending CAN bus data right now. So I hit cancel here. I'm gonna actually take my terminal and put it on one half of the screen here. And I'm going to make another terminal right uh, here we go and put it on the other half of the screen and this way i can send can bus data on one and we can see it show up on the other end over here so we're gonna go ahead and open this can dump so what this is doing now is it is reading data from this virtual can bus you can specify the interface here to be whatever you want right depending on what's on your system and it's going to display all of the can data that appears here in the standard output uh you can change where this sends the data, but for right now, we're just checking that the CAN bus works. So over here, I'm now going to use the CAN send command, right? CAN send. CAN send is a tool that lets you, obviously enough, send CAN bus data, right? And this means just transmitting one CAN bus message onto the bus. So you pick the bus you want, you write out your payload, and then it will appear on the bus. Now, there are a lot of different options to CAN send and CAN dump, of course. You can see them all by using the man page, right? Can send, right? There's a lot of information here for anyone hoping to use this. So don't be afraid if, if I'm not explaining too much, I just kind of have to get through all of these different tools uh, within the duration of this short talk, this short workshop. But for now, a very simple example, let's go ahead and say, can send oh, vcan1, one, two, three. This is gonna be my arbitration ID. This hashtag is the delimiter between the arbitration ID and the data bytes, right? And the Payload, let's make it dead beef, right? You write it out in hexadecimal, and when I press enter, there it is. So now this window here that was reading the data from the CAN bus now shows, okay, we've seen a new message on the CAN bus, VCAN1, arbitration ID is 123, right? It's got four bytes of data. This is the first byte, second byte, third, and fourth, right? Simple as that. That is it's just that simple, right? This is how you would send data from a terminal. Right. I can send this on my virtual CAN bus. I can read it on my virtual CAN bus as well. We have full ability to send and receive CAN bus data now. And you can now use this in any type of tool you want. But there, there are some more CAN bus tools here that we can explore a little bit more. So let's go ahead and look at CAN gen, right? If I say man CAN gen, this is a really fun one, right? CAN frames generator. What it does essentially is it allows you to generate a lot of CAN bus traffic. If you want to send the same message over and over again, you can do that with CanGen, right? Whereas CanSend is every time you run the message, or sorry, you run the command, you get one message. With CanGen, you can actually send messages repeatedly. So you have a lot of options here to adjust the frequency, right? This dash G option allows you to adjust the gap in milliseconds between messages. Uh, you know, you can send extended frame mode, you can send remote transmit frames, you can send 
there's, there's a lot of different options here and they essentially rotate around the idea that you can send incremental data or randomized data or set data, right? So let's go ahead and try and actually see how that would work. So if I wanted to say, let's send the same, we're gonna send a bunch of messages with the same arbitration ID, but with different data values, right? And let's say the same length as well. How can we do that with CanGen? So if we take a look here, the dash L command is used to set the can data length code, right? The dash D or option, sorry, is used to set the actual payload. And the dash I is used to set the can ID mode, right? So we're going to keep I constant. We're going to keep L constant, but we're going to change D. So how do we do that? All right, so let's go ahead and exit the man page. So can gen B can one, right? Dash I, let's pick an arbitration ID. I'm going to pick AAA, right? Dash D, or sorry, dash L, lowercase r for random. Sorry, no, sorry. L, we're going to keep six, six bytes. And then dash D, r for random. And if I hit enter, this should begin generating. Oh, and IG is bigger than 0xFFF. And the, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. I picked a, I picked a number that's a little bit too big. So, so what happened was, Obviously, 7FF is the upper limit for CAN bus arbitration IDs when you're using only 11. And in my ignorance, I just decided to type out three A's, not remembering that it's a little bit too big to fit here. But now if you go over here to the actual CAN dump page, what do you see happening? In sequential order, you can see that every time a new message appears, we see the same arbitration ID, we see the same length on the same network, right? Uh, but the data bytes themselves are actually changing. And so this gives you a better idea of how can dump can be used right can dump is used to display the data on the can bus sequentially you see every single message in the order that they came one by one by one by one by one right what if that's not really what you want to do what if you wanted to reverse engineer uh, a given can bus message right so this is going to be a very limited example of course because i don't have any cool hardware with me at the moment to show you uh, how this can be used to really reverse engineer some CAN data, but there's another tool in the CAN Util suite called CAN Sniffer, right? So if we go ahead and hit man CAN Sniffer here, you can see a little explanation. So this is a volatile CAN content visualizer. What does that mean? It makes it easier to see how CAN bus data is changing. Now, I'm not gonna go over the man page for this one as much as I did with CAN Gen, but if we say, you know, CAN Sniffer be CAN 1, and then I come back here and send the same command as before, right? The same pattern. Instead of showing it sequentially, it's actually showing you only, you know, these messages. And then you can actually see how they change here. So I think I have to enable the colors, right? If I say, I have to say dash C, right? To enable the colors. Yeah, there we go. This is, this is the good stuff, right? So what's going on here now is every time one of these bytes changes in the payload, it's actually highlighted as red. Now, this isn't that helpful because we're sending randomized messages, but in an actual vehicle environment, you can use this technique to actually look for certain bits or bytes that are changing when you do something in the car. And this process is, you know, the process of reverse engineering vehicle data. So if I say, for example, I plug this into my car's CAN bus and I sit here and I'm, I'm wiggling the knob on the, on the steering wheel, right? And I see, okay, oh, this byte changes every time I turn on my headlights or I turn on my, I don't know, my windshield wipers, or if I turn on my churn signal, you can use this kind of tool. And like I said, it doesn't look very, very cool because I just have it running only one arbitration ID, right? But if I just run the default, excuse me, can gen v can one, you'll see a bunch of different can data. And this also isn't very helpful because it's sending a bunch of randomized arbitration IDs as well. And so there's no real updating of any of the arbitration IDs, but, the point is, this makes it much easier to see data on a bus as a whole, and you can actually identify which parts of which messages are changing and learn what the data in the vehicle actually means. Because you have to remember, at the end of the day, the CAN bus data inside this vehicle translates on some level to a real world thing. It could be how fast your car is going. It could be the cabin temperature. It can be anything from, from that to you know, the date and time, the vehicle identification number, right? Everything inside this car means something and finding out what that data means is the first step to hacking your vehicle and actually understanding what's going on under the hood. 
And this tool is really, really good for helping with that. I'm going to show a little bit about how to log CAN bus data as well, uh, just because I feel like that's really helpful. So let me actually create a folder here. Make their uh, CAN class, right? CD CAN class. Oh. Just so that we're all, you know, in the same spot. Um, so, so I have a nice, neat place to put all of my, my files here. So let's go ahead and clear the screen. Logging CAN bus data is done with the same command as reading it. So if I say CAN dump dash L, right? Um, VCAN1, and I hit enter. Disabled standard output while logging, enabling log file CAN dump 2021, 10, 07, and da, 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 da. So now if I come here, I'm actually going to make a third monitor, or a third terminal. All right, I'm going to come here. I'm going to make a new tab. Uh, oh, oops. CD can class clear. Okay, here we go. So we have this file that we just created here, right? That's the log file that we just opened up in the other terminal. I'm going to open, just zoom this in a little bit. And now if I come here and I say can dump the can one, right? No special commands here or no special options. We're just going to use the same one we used before. I'm going to run the same randomized data here. Okay. And I'm just going to let it run for a little bit. I'm going to stop it. Right. We have about, I'd say 25 messages here. I don't really feel like counting them, but nothing shows up here. I'm going to click clear. And now we can go ahead and hit LS. And we have this can dump log, right? This is the log that it created when you ran the command. As soon as you run the command, it will make a log file at the time, you know, automatically including the time and date that you ran the command so that you can have an actual timestamp for this. So looking at this now, we can actually count how many lines are in this, right? WC L is a cool Linux tool for counting how many lines are in a file. And if I say this can dump log, there are 22 lines in this file. And if we come back here and we count them, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Perfect. And if we actually look at the contents, you'll see that cat can dump. Ta da! Why does it look so different? It kind of looks the same, but you can tell there's a bit of a difference in the way the data is presented. It's the same exact data is what we see here in the live can dump output, but it's presented differently. And there's an important difference in the way the data is presented in these two scenarios. So let me actually, can, can, can I, I can't, I don't think I can, <coughs> excuse me, I should have put this one in the other side of the screen so you could look at them side by side. But, you know, message number 164, arbitration ID 791049, right? 164, 791049. So what's going on here is this, is the log format of CanDump. CanDump uses this format specifically for creating log files. And it does this because this file format, right, the way the lines are structured here, makes it easier for a computer to process this log file, excuse me, than this type, right? You got like delimiter, weird figures in here. The parentheses might be hard for a program to process. And this is because the creators of this tool wanted to make this tool easy for a computer to process. So now you have a can file, you know, a log file of this can data. You can actually run this through a program to do processing of the actual data in there, maybe extract some information, so on and so forth. And that's why they decided to make a difference in the different uh, output formats, the log format and the standard output format. The last thing I want to show is the ability to replay can data, right? So can data, of course, can be logged and then played back. When you play it back, it sends it in the exact same order that it came. So over here, I'm going to actually open up a can dump vcan1, right? So we're actively monitoring the vcan1 canvas here. And here we're going to use the can player device, right? The can player command. So this one will allow us to play back this log file here. And it will send the exact same can payloads in the exact same timing as they were captured in that log file. And we're going to see that happen in real time right over here. Hit enter. Oh, shoot. excuse me. I have to specify capital I here for input file, right? And there you go. We have just replayed that can log onto this can bus in exactly the same way it was presented to us originally. This is a really great technique for reverse engineering technique, um, excuse me, can bus data. If you want to take a log of something happening, 
and then play it back to the vehicle and see if the same thing happens again. This is the best way to do it with these open source free tools. It's very easy. Anybody can do it. Of course, there are a lot of complicated options you can use with Camp Player as well. Uh, but the basic usage is the one I just showed here today. So unfortunately, we are running a little bit short on time. So I will have to switch back into the PowerPoint presentation. Um, although, uh, spoiler alert, all I've got left for you is a, um, a thank you for watching screen. So thank you so much for listening. I hopefully you guys enjoyed this short, very short. Unfortunately, I couldn't go into any more details today. Uh, a very short introduction to CAN bus. Hopefully you guys find that CAN bus and automotive security and car hacking are interesting things. I personally love the field I work in. I'm always happy to help anyone interested in getting uh, involved. So please, by all means, if you have any questions, concerns, you want more information, go ahead and send me an email. I'd be happy to point you in the direction of resources if I can't answer you directly myself. Um, but I'm always happy to speak to um, people who are interested in automotive security. I think it's a great industry and we need more professionals. So by all means, come on in and, and let's hack cars together. So thank you all so much for your time. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of SyncOn.